True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. It's a simple question with a diabolically difficult answer. Is Tegan Lane dead or alive? She was last seen as a two-day-old leaving a Sydney hospital with her mother, Kelly, an aspiring Australian Olympian. What happened to baby Tegan after that has never been explained. A popular elite water polo player secretly gives birth to three children. She adopts two of them out, but one, Tegan, simply vanishes. How can a child disappear without anyone knowing? Kelly says that she walked out on day two, she was discharged, she walked out with Tegan and with a man who she says is the father of the baby, this mysterious man called Andrew, who's never been found, never come forward. She walked out with him, handed him the baby in the foyer, said, you raise it. It was a deal, it was arranged, and that was it. Off he went and Tegan's never been found. And she got in a cab and headed home. And then a couple of hours later, she appears at a wedding in Manly, where she's from, in a white suit. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Now, Dick, you're a computer expert. Tell me, what makes a data breach the worst breach of all time? Well, what about losing our social security numbers, keys to our identities? How about losing 145 million of them? Wow. Breach is a podcast that takes you inside the world's biggest hacks. How they are done, who does them, and what's really at stake when your private data is compromised. And this season, they're investigating the worst breach ever, Equifax. Listen to Season 2 of Breach, the Equifax story. This time, it's personal. Subscribe to Breach, that's B-R-E-A-C-H, in your podcast app today. In order to support True Crime Brewery, we will need the help of some great advertisers. And in order to find great advertisers, we'll need to learn a little bit more about you. Please go to podsurvey.com forward slash brewery and take a quick anonymous survey that will help us get to know you a little bit better. That way we can show advertisers just how great our listeners really are. Plus, once you've completed the survey, you can choose to enter for a chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card. Terms and conditions apply. That's podsurvey.com slash B-R-E-W-E-R-Y. Thanks in advance for your help. Between the ages of 17 and 24, Kelly Lane had two abortions and gave birth to three babies, all without the knowledge of her mother, Sandra, or her police officer father, Robert. Not only that, but her five pregnancies occurred while Kelly was playing water polo at a national level and was spending most of her time in a swimsuit. Kelly's child, Tegan Lane, born in 1996, went home with Kelly two days after her birth. Kelly was at a friend's wedding that evening, and not a word was spoken about her newborn daughter. Tegan was never seen again. Investigators believe that Kelly killed Tegan, disposing of her body before her family and friends could learn of the infant's existence. Kelly claims that she gave Tegan to her biological father and that he disappeared with the baby. Kelly's supporters appear to believe her story. But what is the likelihood that this man and Tegan would never be found? More mysterious, perhaps, are the reasons for Kelly's multiple hidden pregnancies and her overall strange behavior. Today's story is one of the oddest that we have covered. There are gaping holes in Kelly Lane's story, but also there's no physical evidence that Tegan is dead. Join us today for a true mystery from Australia. Where is Tegan Lane? And guess what? An Australian beer. I have an Australian beer, which was gifted to us by some lovely people from Australia, Lisa and David. Yes, thanks guys. So the beer is Brunswick Bitter brewed by Thunder Road Brewing in Brunswick, Australia. This is a nice, refreshing little beer. Not great, not shitty. Okay. So it's a a clear gold color, very tiny white head, nice aroma, some sweet malt and floral hops. Got kind of a biscuity, little caramel taste, some late grapefruit taste at the end with the hops. It's light and refreshing. 
and it's only 4.9%, so we could pound a few of these down today. Well, let's make that our goal then. Let's do it. Okay. Let's open it up first. Right, we'll open it up, and don't forget to call Uber. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, of course. All right, Dick, join me here at the quiet end. This is quite a story. It was actually suggested to us by some Australian friends. I'm not sure if it was the same couple that sent us the beer, because we have a lot of people from Australia that listen to the podcast, which is great. We seem to be popular with those guys. Yeah, they're cool people, I think. They are. It's a disturbing case. So Kelly Lane was born to Robert and Sandra, called Sandy Lane, in 1975. The family moved to Manly, a town in the Northern Beaches area, which is north of Sydney, in 1979. And the move was so that the Lanes could be closer to their jobs. Rob was the first grade rugby coach in Manly. Now, first grade means they're high up. It's not first graders that he's coaching. Right. It's the highest ranking one, yeah. And he had been the coach for three years. He was also a policeman. He expected to be transferred to the Manly Police Station, so he'd have his coaching and his policing at the same place. And then Sandra worked in an administrative role at the Manly Hospital. So it was a wise move for all of them. Yes. Now, these days... The northern beaches are among the most expensive places to live in Australia. But when the lanes moved there, it was more of a working-class area. Rob had ties to the area even before he moved his family there. In the 1960s, he was a first-grade rugby player with Manly and almost made the Australian national team. As his years as a player were coming to a close, the head coach of Manly was fired, and Rob got his position. Now, he promptly turned the team around from 1977 to 79 and then 81 to 82. He actually was let go in 1980 and rehired in 81, so that's the gap. Mm -hmm. But he made the semifinals every year, the finals twice, and the grand final once. The downside was they never won the championship overall. Rob's success, though, put him in the social elite of Manly, and Sandy became the social queen bee. And as successful as he was, Rob failed to win the new South Wales Championship, the Shoot Shield, as they call it, and he was fired after the 82 season. The new coach won the Shoot Shield his first year. In 1986, after two bad years of rugby, Rob was reappointed as the first grade head coach. The 1987 season started off really well, but then the team tanked. So sensing he would be fired at the end of the season, Rob just went ahead and resigned. He did, though, continue to be a senior statesman for the club, and his family were looked upon as local royalty. Yeah, they were uh, among the elite of Manly. Everybody wanted to talk to them, be around them, especially the sporting people. So we've got the rugby team and then uh, the swim team, life-saving, water polo, so on. Yes. There is is a lot going on. Mm Mm-hmm. The owner of the rugby team must have a short fuse or something. I mean, he's turning around firing people right and left. Yeah, I kind of felt like sports worked that way. But no, not always, I guess. No, you'll give the coach some time to settle and improve himself. So, you know, he he coaches for two or three years and then gets fired, and then gets rehired, then gets fired, then gets rehired, then resigns. So it's kind of funny, isn't it? It is. Well, through all this, little Kelly Lane was growing up, and she had shown some amazing sporting ability since she was pretty little. So by the time she was a teenager, she was on her way to becoming an elite athlete. Her sport was water polo, and she dreamed of representing Australia in the Olympics. But she was an average student, so sports and partying were her big focus. She was able to drink as much as the guys, and her first boyfriend, Aaron, was an elite kayaker who also had Olympic aspirations. Kelly was looked up to because of her family and because of her sports, She was very tall, muscular, athletic, so I could see why she would be able to drink as much as the guys. She wasn't a petite little girl. No, she was a a good-sized woman. Yes. I don't mean that in a bad way. No, 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 of course not. You have to be a good enough size anyway. Water polo is a, a rough sport. Super rough. I saw interviews with some of her friends who had tried it with her and said, oh, no, that's not for me. Yeah. 
which makes this story even more amazing and horrifying in a way, right? Yeah, so you, you got to do the, all this stuff in a pool, so you're kind of treading water the whole time. You're not standing on the bottom of the no, pool. No, you've got to be strong. And you're getting pushed and shoved and kicked and all sorts of things under the water. Yes, it's a rough sport. In 1992, Kelly became pregnant, this despite being on the pill, or so she said. She and Aaron talked things over, and Kelly elected to have an abortion. And this might have spelled the end of their relationship, because over the next year, they uh, got further and further apart, and they eventually went their separate ways. Yeah, but she still had her ambitions for water polo. Yeah, those were there the whole time. In March 1993, she played for New South Wales in the Under-20s Championships. They won the title, and Kelly was selected to train with an Australian junior women's development squad. However, it was becoming apparent with Kelly that while she was an excellent player, she really wasn't among the elite women who were water polo athletes. She was good, but she wasn't probably going to make the Olympics. Right, yeah, she she was certainly an elite upper-level player, but didn't have that little bit extra that she needed to make the Olympics or the national team. I guess we should say that, because at the time... Women's water polo wasn't an Olympic sport. It did right. become one. But at least if, if she made the national team, she could have made the Olympics. But she wasn't going to make the national team. Yeah. Well, when it was announced that Australia would host the 2000 Olympic Games, Kelly was excited. She had high hopes that there would be a team, first of all, and that she would make that team. But on the romantic front, Kelly was winding down her relationship with her post Aaron boyfriend, her next boyfriend, and she became friendly with a new rugby player, and this was Duncan Gillies. He was the son of a doctor, had joined the Manly team, and it quickly became apparent that he was heading to be a star. At least that's what they thought. He had uh, one or two older brothers that were excellent players. Yes. So can you imagine the pressure there? No kidding. That's just an aside, but incredible pressure. Yeah. I mean, not one older brother, but both older brothers. Yes, right? Wow. Yeah. But he and Kelly began dating, and very quickly, they were in a sexual relationship. They shared a bed both at Kelly's house, where she still lived with her parents, and wherever Duncan would be living at the time. So things were looking good for Kelly and her family. Sandy continued to enjoy her status as the social queen bee, Rob was a sergeant in the police department and was very admired by the rugby crowd, and Kelly continued to dream of the Olympics. But then, in 1994, Kelly became pregnant again, and her parents didn't know about either of these pregnancies. She never went to them about those. She lived in this tightly knit athletic family, and it wasn't long before someone noted that she was gaining a little weight. And this led to the inevitable question of whether she could be pregnant. Her friends thought it wasn't possible, yet she did have a bit of a belly, and she had begun wrapping herself in a towel while walking around the pool deck during water polo practices. During this time, she and Duncan began having some problems in their relationship, and he confessed to her about kissing and possibly sleeping with one of her teammates and friends. Her name was Taryn. Kelly spoke with Taryn and was satisfied nothing had happened between her and Duncan, and she forgave Duncan. Yeah, Duncan, well, I I guess there was a fair amount of drinking that had been going on. Well, there usually was, it seems like, in this crowd. It it does. I mean, that's that's what they did. It doesn't seem like the pregnancy really slowed that down. Duncan didn't know about the pregnancy. They parted like crazy. Yes. Yeah, Duncan was under the impression that he had slept with Taryn, and Taryn said, no, you didn't. (laughs) Okay, that's embarrassing. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So her water polo team was preparing to face Sydney University in the water polo club grand final. Kelly's team played well, but lost the match. So afterwards, everyone hit the pub, celebrating the end of the season. A few hours into the evening, some of Kelly's teammates noted she was missing, but nobody seemed real concerned about this. You know, maybe she just went home early, who knows, she's just not here. Yeah, but in fact, she was at the hospital having a baby. Yeah. giving birth. Yeah. She'd begun having contractions as she arrived at the pub, and she drove herself to the hospital and delivered a full-term baby. After the delivery, Kelly began crying uncontrollably, and when nothing the nursing staff did seemed to calm her down, a social worker was called in. 
Kelly told the social worker that she wanted to put the child up for adoption. She told her that she was an elite water polo player and she'd been selected to play on the national team that was to compete in Canada. She told the social worker that she and the father of the baby Duncan had recently moved from Perth to Sydney and that her parents lived in Perth. She also said that her parents were aware of the pregnancy and were disappointed in her, but supportive. Now, all of those are lies. Yes, just lie after lie after lie. Not one of those statements is true. Just the one that she wanted to put the baby for adoption. Everything else was a lie. Right. And the next couple of months were really busy for Kelly. She was training vigorously for the World Junior Water Polo Championship in Canada, and she was quite involved in the adoption process for the baby, which was kind of required of her, right? Yeah, she needed to be. It's it's not like you just deliver the baby, drop it off, and that's that. No, and adopting the baby was difficult without involving Duncan, who was supposedly the father. Yeah, well, they needed his okay on the, on the papers too, right? Sure, yeah. So she gave a false address for Duncan, then she forged the papers that he was supposed to sign. Finally, she met the adoptive parents, and she was happy. They seemed like a nice couple. So when everything was completed, Kelly made a special request of the social worker. She wanted to keep all the papers and photos in the social worker's office instead of taking them home with her. So this was an unusual request, but the social worker agreed to do that. It is kind of unusual. Well, yeah. Especially since she's saying that her parents and the father of the baby were aware of this. Right. It's it's like she just wanted to erase every memory of that baby. Yes, right. So the water polo tournament was a huge success. Kelly's team won the silver medal, which was a huge achievement for Australia. Now, she wasn't selected to the senior squad, but she did continue with the juniors. And meanwhile, in these same championships, the senior squad defeated the Netherlands, and they became world champions. So that's pretty cool. But Kelly played water polo through the whole pregnancy. She did. This rough sport where people are kicking and clawing and climbing over you. and It's kind of horrifying to think that a fetus went through that. That was really putting that fetus at risk, as well as herself. Yeah, I, I would bet if she had been getting regular care, and the midwife or physician knew she was playing water polo, they would have said, don't do it. Well, of course. I think that goes without saying, yeah. This wasn't safe. Oh, but she carried the term and And delivered a healthy baby. As far as we know, the baby's been fine. The year of 1996 began pretty well for Kelly, too. She was selected to play for the senior team for the first time then, and she was going to start college. She was hoping to become a phys ed teacher. Her boyfriend, Duncan, was offered a contract to play for Canterbury, and he bought a house, and Kelly stayed with him quite often, but not as often as she wanted to. That Valentine's Day, Duncan gave her a car so she didn't have to borrow her mom's all the time, and in April, she turned 21, and there was a huge party for her. She did well at school, and in August, she was giving the job of coaching water polo at Ravenswood, which is a prestigious private school for girls. Not long after getting that job, Kelly began putting on some weight again, and the pregnancy rumors came back. The rumors turned out to be more than just rumors because she was actually pregnant again. This is like a year later, right? Pretty much, yeah. Maybe two. Not even, yeah. It's one right after the other. Yep. So on September 11th, 1996... Kelly entered the Auburn Hospital. So this is a different hospital than the last birth. Exactly. Okay. She told the nursing staff there that she was two weeks past her due date and was having intense back pain. She wasn't registered to deliver at Auburn. So she told them she had planned on a home birth and gave them a fictitious name and phone number of her midwife. Now, the hospital staff was unable to contact the midwife but they went ahead with an induction, and Kelly delivered a little girl the next evening. There was a small complication. There was some bleeding during delivery, and Kelly lost about a liter of blood. Now, the baby looked closer to two weeks prior to due date than two weeks later than due date, but was a healthy baby, and 38 weeks is still term. So why do we think that she wanted them to believe she was past due? Was there something coming up? She needed to get this out of the way? Well, I think so. Yeah. Why Uh, else would she do that? 
Well, well, she just didn't want to be pregnant anymore. It had to be a burden for her because she's keeping it a secret from absolutely yeah, everyone. I, I guess maybe she's figuring that uh, if she goes another couple of weeks, people are going to discover for sure she's pregnant. Who knows? There, there's plenty of suspicion. Yes, Al- right. Although nothing was confirmed. No, nobody ever asked her if she was pregnant. Not and she never told anyone, not even a close friend, no, nobody. Nobody. And she didn't get any prenatal care at all. Right. So the next day, a nurse from Ride Hospital called. Kelly had been there for a few hours before she turned up at Auburn Hospital. She'd been there seeking to be induced. And the caller from that hospital had been unable to contact Kelly's midwife, too. Kelly told the staff at Auburn her boyfriend and parents were out of the country, but would be returning soon. She also told them that in about three months, she, Duncan, and the baby would be moving to London. Well, another lie. Now, why didn't she just say that she was raped and there was no father and her her parents weren't around or something? This Uh, is making it more complicated to say these people exist and aren't knowing. Yeah, but she still wants to appear to be the good girl. I think you're right. Yep. I gave that some consideration and absolutely I think that's what it was. She was very preoccupied with her image as Kelly Lane. Yes. Yes. So she told the hospital staff she wanted to be discharged on the 14th and she was given a blue book for the baby's upcoming health checks, as well as birth registration, Medicare, which is their universal insurance for everyone, and Social Security forms. Kelly filled out the Medicare form, and in the space for the baby's name, she wrote Tegan Lee Lane. As soon as she was given the okay to leave, she collected her forms, picked up her baby, and left the hospital. So here's the stunning part for me. Okay. Is that she leaves the hospital... She goes home and gets ready for a wedding. Turns up at a wedding, acting totally normal, right? Right. It's just a few hours later, she and Duncan attend a wedding of some friends. There's no sign of her being upset or anything, no mention of the baby, of course. And Tegan disappeared and was never seen again. Now also, Kelly was wearing a white suit. What postpartum woman would wear a white suit to a wedding? Well, she must have been well padded. I guess. It just seems crazy. Doesn't it? Yes. It's really shocking that she could behave that way. It just seems so cold. Well, and the other thing that gets me is the first baby gets adopted out. Yes. Why didn't she do that with this baby? Yeah, I don't know. I I hate to say it, but maybe it was just quicker so she could get to that wedding and not look suspicious. She went to this wedding, she wore a white suit, she partied, looked happy, looked normal. Where's Tegan? Tegan's disappeared. She left the hospital with Tegan, but we don't know what happened. Nope. Okay. She she went home and got ready for the wedding. She didn't have a baby with her when she got home. No, no, she didn't. And she had a baby with her when she left the hospital. Yes. So in 1997, Kelly was dropped from the senior squad and she was not invited to the FINA Women's World Cup. Women's water polo was going to be included in the 2000 games, and Kelly was still hopeful that she would be on that team. Duncan's professional career was not really progressing that well either. After his first year with Canterbury, he was not offered another contract. He did, however, find a position on a Scottish rugby team, and he still played for Manly. When he did return to Australia, he told Kelly he had found someone else and he broke up with her. So Kelly was devastated. Her friends were supportive of her, but they were secretly glad because a lot of them didn't like Duncan. No, they all thought he was a pompous asshole. Yeah, and maybe kind of a cheater. A player. So in 1997 and 1998, Kelly's water polo career just continued to be static. But she was still playing. She was still playing. Mm -hmm. Uh, She missed being chosen for the senior women's squad again. Then in February 1999, at the national tournament in Noosa, she was knocked out in the first round of the selection process. So that ended her Olympic dreams. So she commiserated with a couple of her closest friends, Melinda and Katie. And they all agreed it was a shame about the Olympics. And they all agreed that Duncan was a first-class loser. Now, why did they think he's a first-class loser? Because he broke up with her and he was... Because he broke up with her. That's that's the first thing. He wouldn't break up with her if he wasn't such a loser. Well, who knows about that. But well, 
I think that there was some thought, at least in Kelly's mind, that they would end up getting married. That was what she told her friends, that that was her expectation. I'm not sure. I mean, she had a lot of a lot of bedmates. Yes, but most of her friends thought she was, you know, went from boyfriend to boyfriend, didn't do a lot of one-night stands, although these secret pregnancies really just kind of clear the board for us on what could have happened. Right. So Kelly was happy that she had her job at Ravenswood, and she was ready to finish her college career and get her degree. Now, her social life stayed busy. Her friend Melinda was getting married. Kelly was going to be a bridesmaid. Now, at the wedding, several people noted that Kelly seemed to, again, have put on some weight. Then a couple of weeks later, Kelly ran into Duncan's mother at a surf club. And Duncan's mom, who was a nurse, also thought that Kelly looked a little thick around the waist. And sure enough, she was pregnant again. Which no one knew. Again, this is a stealth pregnancy. Yes. So she flew to a clinic in Brisbane where they performed second trimester abortions. But once she was examined, they found out that she was more than 25 weeks pregnant. So she was no longer a candidate for a termination of the pregnancy. So once again, she was going to give birth. She went back to Ride Hospital, where she had been, had been seen on two occasions when she was pregnant with Tegan, and she told her same story. The father of the baby and her parents were in London, and she was in Australia alone. When her name was entered into the computer, it was found that she had delivered a baby girl at Auburn Hospital three years earlier. So they asked, so this is your second child? And Kelly said yes. The nurse asked Kelly if she wanted to breastfeed, and Kelly said she wasn't sure. She'd breastfed her daughter for six months, she said, and wasn't sure if she wanted to do it again. She also told the nurse that she had been receiving her prenatal care at the Royal Women's Hospital in Brisbane. Another pack of lies there. Rapid fire. The hospital in Brisbane had no record of Kelly Lane being treated there. Kelly showed up at Ride Hospital several days later, and she delivered a healthy infant there. The day after the baby's birth... Kelly called her friend Lisa, but not to tell her about the birth, but to discuss travel plans. See, she and Lisa were planning a six-week trip to the UK and Europe that December. And after she hung up with Lisa, that's when Kelly called an adoption agency. She used Anglicare, a different agency than she used four years ago with the first secret baby. Adoption worker Virginia Fung took Kelly's call and Kelly told her the father of the baby left her when he found out she was pregnant. So Virginia called the social worker who met with Kelly, and Kelly told the social worker she wanted the adoption to be done as discreetly as possible. At this point, Virginia didn't know that Kelly had given birth before, and Kelly said nothing to her about Tegan or her first baby who'd been adopted, nor her attempt to have this baby aborted earlier. So Kelly was discharged and the baby remained in the hospital, awaiting foster care placement. The nurses at Ride Hospital were unable to contact Kelly after she was discharged. The address and phone number that she'd given them were false, and Kelly proved to be very hard to reach. She called Virginia numerous times after hours to leave messages on her machine, but when Virginia tried to contact her, her phone was usually turned off. So she didn't really want to talk to this woman. No, she was doing her best to dodge her. Yes. So the baby actually was doing quite well in foster care. But the foster care agreement was only for one month and then was supposed to be adopted out. So this month of foster care was about to expire. And Virginia continued to have difficulty contacting Kelly. She was told by the ride nurses of Kelly's previous pregnancy and was beginning to think that maybe Kelly wasn't being completely honest with her. No kidding. However, Virginia was sincere about her role in all this, and she didn't want to make any moral judgments about Kelly. So she asked Kelly if she truly wanted to go through with the adoption. Kelly said she did, and she agreed to meet Virginia the next day with her passport so she could sign the adoption papers. However, the next day she failed to show up, and then she sent Virginia the next day of fax, saying that she had to be in Canberra about a legal matter. So I wonder if she just couldn't make it there. Why was she avoiding this? She wanted the child to be adopted. Yeah, just I don't know. Troubled I mean, juggling two lives? Working on a story? Yeah, maybe. 
But by this point, the foster care had expired, so in the eyes of the law, the baby had been abandoned. Child Protection Officer John Borovnik was assigned to the case. He arranged for continuation of the baby's care while Virginia kept trying to contact Kelly. Borovnik thought Kelly was intentionally abandoning her baby, so he made an attempt to verify her story. He learned from a nurse at Ride that Kelly may have had another baby. He also learned that Kelly had not traveled to or from the UK in the past two years. When Virginia spoke with Kelly again, she asked, Is this your first baby? And Kelly again said yes. But John Borovnik confirmed that Kelly had another child, so Kelly continued to lie to her, and Virginia decided to start her own search. She found out that Duncan was in Sydney and playing rugby for Manly. Virginia needed to obtain his signature for the adoption, so she wrote Duncan a letter, and while he was deciding what to do, the day for signing the adoption papers arrived. Inexplicably, Kelly was a no-show, but Virginia now had two real phone numbers for Kelly, one for her parents and one for Ravenswood School where she worked. So Kelly continued to have a bunch of excuses for not meeting with this woman. When they finally spoke, Virginia told her she needed to meet with Duncan to discuss the adoption of the baby, and Duncan did eventually call Virginia, but he was stunned to hear that he was named as the father because he said he and Kelly had broken up over a year before this, so he couldn't be the father of this baby. Not unless she had a 15-month pregnancy. Yes. So when Virginia confronted Kelly with this information, Kelly said yes, she had lied. Duncan was not the father but she continued to maintain that this was her first child. Things did eventually get worked out for this one child, and that adoption did proceed. Here's where things start getting really tough for old Kelly. Yeah. So the same day that the adoption was finalized, Borovnik received a health department record showing that Kelly had given birth to a baby girl three years previously. So he left a voicemail for Virginia with that info. Then a couple days later, Virginia received a phone call from a different child services worker who told her Kelly had put up a child for adoption in 1995. So at this point, Virginia and Borovnik were unaware that this information indicated the existence of two previous children. They thought they were all talking about the same kid. Oh, they just thought it was like a typo with the dates? Yeah, I mean, this was all by telephone. So they say, yeah, 96, 95... They just assumed it was the same child, not two separate children. I guess you would, because it would be very unusual to have two like that. It would. So meanwhile, Kelly was enjoying her work at Ravenswood, and by the beginning of 1999, she was offered a full-time position and was also named coordinator for the primary school girls' physical education. She and Virginia had a series of meetings in the school chapel, and Virginia told her she was aware that Kelly had given up a child for adoption back in 1995. That was the one before Tegan. Kelly said she was relieved that this had finally come to light, but at the same time, she was hoping they didn't know anything about Tegan. Borovnik got a third confirmation that Kelly had actually delivered three children. One had been born in 1995 and adopted out. One was delivered in 99. This one that we're talking about also adopted out. The infant born in 1996 had not been adopted, and there just were no records on her. So when Borovnik confronted Kelly about this baby, he said he was going to have to call the police because he felt there should be an investigation since there were no records on the baby. Kelly wrote Virginia and said, yes, there were in fact three babies. This middle baby was given to the father and the father's significant other, and the other two had been adopted. So I'm thinking here... Kelly's really in a panic because her house of cards is coming down, so to say. I would think so. Yeah, I mean, things are closing in on her. Things things are falling apart. Well, she's already been exposed as a serial liar. And then there were concerns that she was being untruthful again. Aaron Williams, the man she claimed fathered her third child, couldn't be found. The person she named as her midwife for Tegan was a nurse, not a registered midwife and the case was transferred to the Manly Police Station for further investigation. Matt Kehoe was a young detective in the Manly Police Station who was assigned to the case of Tegan Lane. Although young, he had a reputation for being very thorough, and he was held in high regard at the station. However, he did seem to drop the ball in his investigation of Tegan. 
he failed to recognize that he was working on a missing persons case that was possibly a homicide. There were also significant corruption problems in that station, which resulted in Kehoe being mostly unsupervised. He also knew Kelly's dad. Kehoe ended up treating the whole matter as something that would just resolve itself without the police having any part in it. Consequently, he did not interview Kelly for at least a year and a half. Routine evidence gathering was not carried out as it should have been. He also never contacted the hospitals, Virginia the social worker, or John Borovnik. Basically, the case just languished for years. Yeah, I suspect from doing the research on this that Kehoe knew Kelly's father. Yeah, he did. And really didn't feel like he should be the one investigating Rob's daughter. But okay. that wasn't going to happen. He was told, you're the guy. So there's no one he can hand it off to? Not that he was able to do. That doesn't seem right. Well, it would seem a little odd that somebody who was friendly with the, the parents would be the investigator. Anyway, he seemed to treat this as something that was just a matter for the Lanes to resolve. A family matter. A family matter. Yes. Well... It seems like he fucked up, but in his defense, I'd say he probably didn't think, oh, this young woman killed her baby. Why would you think that? No, you That's just way off the wall. And it it was termed uh, an incident or something like that, not a disappearance, not a possible crime or anything like that. Right, not a missing person's case, not a homicide. So it was presented to him as, here, here's what was told to us, and I, I don't think he was that eager to look into it. No. Well, around this time, Kelly was becoming involved with a new guy. This was Peter, and he was the son of a couple who were good friends with Kelly's parents. So Kelly wants to please her parents, right? So this must have been a good thing for her. Peter had been living in the UK, and when he decided to move back to Sydney, the Lanes offered him a room in their house. So that's easy access, convenience. Yeah, well, that was that was going to be, you know, stay with us until you find your own place type of thing. It was a temporary arrangement. Yes, but he was cute. Kelly was attractive, and they were about the same age. They got along well, and they decided to be housemates. And once they set up a household together, the relationship changed from being a friendship to becoming a romance. So what followed was almost predictable in a really sick way, because Kelly got pregnant. There's nothing wrong with her fertility, is there? Gosh, no. So it was during this last pregnancy that Detective Kehoe finally got around to questioning Kelly. So she told Kehoe the father of Tegan was a man named Andrew Morris, and he was nine years older than her. She said that at the time she became pregnant with Tegan, Morris was living with his girlfriend, who was a woman named Mel. And this was the couple that Kelly said she gave Tegan to. And that was it, basically, for the investigation until late 2002, early 2003. And this was when Detective Senior Constable Gott arrived at Manly. Now, Gott was one of the new officers assigned to Manly in the wake of the corruption scandal and the house cleaning that resulted from that. So basically, you got a whole new bunch of people involved. Right. Running the station. So Gott was the one who found out that Kelly was in a stable relationship, had an 18-month-old daughter, and had been coaching water polo at an elite private school for seven years by then. Kelly's story, if it was to be believed, meant that Tegan was alive. And if Tegan was alive, there was no serious crime committed. Now, I have to just take issue with that, Dick, because even if she didn't kill that baby, and she gave the baby to a guy who she'd had sex with a few times, and not checked up on how her baby was doing or gone through a legal adoption... To me, that's abandoning that baby. Oh, you're right. I think that is a crime. You don't just hand your baby over when it's a couple days old to someone. I would agree. Especially when you don't even know where they are now. But I I can see his thinking, God's thinking, that if if she was alive uh, and doing well, then it wasn't that huge a deal. Well, how would we know she's doing well? No one knows where the baby is. Well... That's what he's going to find out, right? If, I hope so. If she's alive, is she thriving or not? Thriving? I mean, who's who's she with? Where is she? Come on. I just think it's very uh, naive, like purposely oh. naive. There's well, a word for that. Of course it is. 
It's like he doesn't want to have to deal with it. But if the baby was alive and, and doing well, then it was less of an issue. Even though, I know, at, at the time it occurred, it's, it's as you said, I would consider it abandonment, giving a two-day-old to some guy you've had sex with a couple times. Well, I mean, there has to be some accountability. You give birth to a baby, you can't just hand it over to someone. And we did a case like that once, where the woman actually got away with saying she gave her baby to a couple. That's such bullshit. You can't just say that. Right. There has to be some responsibility for that child's well-being that you've given birth to. Well, absolutely. But I, I think you'd have to agree that if Tegan was alive, it was less less of an issue than if she wasn't alive. <laughs> well, sure. Yeah. I mean, yes. But it's still a serious crime. Okay. It's not murder. Right. But it's still very serious and shouldn't be ignored. He said that he needed to find Tegan, so I give him credit for that. But I think that's been minimized. Well, maybe not minimized, but pushed back a little bit. Sure. Kelly said she'd given Tegan to a man named Andrew Norris this time, and God had been looking for a man named Morris. When questioned about this, Kelly said the previous policeman must have been mistaken. She told God her friend Lisa knew Andrew Norris and knew about the pregnancy. Kelly, though, claimed to have lost touch with Lisa and didn't know how to contact her. As Gott continued to question Kelly, she gave him different information than she had given Detective Kehoe just two years earlier. Before he began to question Kelly, Gott thought Tegan was probably alive, but now he was having his doubts. Kelly's changing her story was really raising suspicions. Yeah, so the next few months, Gott was busy trying to follow up on all the possible leads. In his search for the, Tegan's father, he looked for both... Morris and Norris as surnames. He sent letters to all the schools in the state looking for females born in 1996. He checked with Medicare and found no activity for Tegan. No one has asked for Tegan to be added to their card, and no individual card had been issued to Tegan Lane. He spoke with Lisa's mother and found that Lisa and Kelly were still in frequent contact. So Kelly's told lie after lie after lie, and got realized the need for a thorough investigation. Hallelujah, at Yay. this point. Yeah, because she hasn't said one truthful thing. And when she gets caught in a lie, she just adds another lie to it. Exactly, yeah. So after months of this back and forth, Kelly came to the police station for an interview, and got had a recorder, a camera, and another police officer. He wasn't taking any chances. And this was the time when he told Kelly that he believed Tegan was not alive. So he also began to interview her friends. And none of them were really helpful because they'd been lied to also. He attempted to find the apartment where Kelly said that this Morris Norris lived. And Kelly said she couldn't remember the address, but she knew it was a five-minute walk from the Town Hall Hotel. After Gott and Kelly had driven around a bit, they found a block of flats that looked familiar to her. So Kelly pointed out two apartments and said that was where she had the affair. She just couldn't remember which one it was. So rental records failed to produce anyone who might have been the man that she described. And a canvas of residents of the building also failed to find this Morris slash Norris. Now this just gives me flashbacks to Casey Anthony. Right. Right? This is where the nanny was. Zanny the nanny. Zanny the nanny has I mean, I feel like Kelly's almost to that level where she's willing to just lie to the bitter end. Well, she's she's gotten to the point where she has to. Well, because she killed that baby. Because if she was telling the truth, she doesn't have to. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So and she fell into her same pattern with Gott, where she didn't answer her phone and didn't respond to his calls. Gott had a phone tap on Kelly's home phone, and then he finally visited her at home. Obviously, she's not real happy to see him. So she accused him, but, of alienating all her friends, and she said that her fiancé might leave her and take their daughter. She told God that Duncan was not Tegan's father. She also seemed to be more concerned with who God had spoken to than to the possibility that Tegan was dead. Oh yeah, I mean that really stuck out to me, how her concern was how she looked to people. There was really no concern for this child. And if she hadn't killed the child, why wasn't she concerned about how she was doing. You would think. But she stuck with her story, the first one that she told him about Morris Norris, that she was pregnant with him, 
and that he had taken the child. The next time she spoke with him was from the hospital after she delivered Tegan, she said, and he arrived with his partner, Mel, and mother to collect the baby. She said there had been absolutely no contact in between. So isn't that weird, too? Absolutely. She, she tells this guy, I'm pregnant, and maybe you might want to take the baby, and then has no contact until she actually delivers the baby, and he arrives to take the baby. That just stretches the bounds of credibility. It all does, yes. After Gott left, Kelly called her friend Katie to try and find out what people had said to him, and she continued to worry about what her parents and friends would say when they found out about Tegan. She was really obsessed with telling her fiancé, Peter. But no concern for Tegan, so make what you will of that. Now Peter, who was going to marry Kelly the next month, was really stunned to hear that she had had three other babies before their own was born. But he turned out to be incredibly supportive and forgiving of her. She still had to tell her parents, though, and she decided to tell her mom first. And her mom wasn't sure that she believed her. Two days later, she told her father, Robert, and after that, got visited with the Lanes. During his visit, it became apparent that Kelly had only told them about Tegan and not about the other infants that she'd given up for adoption. So she didn't come clean. No. And can you imagine the parents' surprise that she's finally told them about this daughter that's missing and nothing about the other two pregnancies before and after. And And then the earlier pregnancies, the abortions earlier, weren't mentioned either. Nope. A few weeks later, Kelly and Peter were married in a beachside ceremony, and this was the kind of wedding Kelly had always dreamed of. It seemed that her family and friends believed her when she said that Tegan was still alive. On March 18, 2004, Detective Gott referred Tegan's case to the coroner's court as a possible death. At least in the beginning, the media wasn't involved in this. He continued his search for Tegan and the man Kelly claimed to have given her to. Gott searched for any Social Security payments made in relation to a female born September 12, 1996, by a man named Andrew Norris, and he found none. He checked the births, deaths, and marriages registry in every state and territory for any female born in 1996 with a father named Andrew Norris, and he found none. He contacted the Department of Immigration for any child born September 12, 1996 with the surname Norris, who had either entered or left the country, and again, nothing was found. He also searched Australia's election rolls, driver's license records, police records, and was totally unsuccessful in finding this Andrew Norris. It seems like they conducted a pretty exhaustive search. And there's more done later. And and it was ongoing. Yes. I mean, it didn't just end when the inquest was held. Mm Mm-mm. And meanwhile, Kelly and her parents had lawyered up, and there was no more communication with the police. Homicide investigators were brought in to help with this case and despite exhaustive searches, they could find nothing about Tegan or the man that Kelly said she'd given Tegan to. So hearings into this missing child matter began in August 2004. The media hadn't been notified about the case, and there was also a non-publication order in effect, which meant that if, if there was a news person sitting in the courtroom and they heard stuff about Kelly's case, they were not allowed to publish it. So it's kind of like a gag order? A gag order. Yeah. So the police, meanwhile, have gotten a warrant to have a listening device placed in Kelly and Peter's living room. Yeah. And we heard Kelly bemoaning the effects of the investigation, how her life had been ruined, how the authorities didn't seem to be making much of an effort to find Tegan, all that stuff. But she'd never made an effort to find Tegan. Not a bit. So while this non-publication order remained in effect, there were still reporters who attended the court hearings. In hopes of obtaining more information, the judge basically said, give the court more information or I will lift the non-publication order. So after conversing with Kelly, her attorney said nothing more would be forthcoming. So at this point, the non-publication order was rescinded. And in June 2005, John Abernethy was named to preside over the hearing, and he would be assisted by Rebecca Beecroft. So one of Kelly's concerns did prove to be true. She was fired from Ravenswood. So as we start the testimony, Kelly's friend Katie testified, 
and her husband Peter testified, and her father testified. Now, there wasn't any new evidence that came from these testimonies other than uh, showing how much Kelly had been lying. Okay, why don't we take a time out here to our sponsors. Okay. Take coloring your hair to the next level with one of my favorite beauty products, Madison Reed Hair Color. For as long as I can remember, there were two options for coloring my hair. Outdated at-home color, you know, the stuff you pick up at the grocery or the drugstore, or the considerable financial and time investment of salon visits. We're busy women, and you shouldn't have to be rich to have multi-tonal hair coloring that's crafted by master colorists. You deserve gorgeous professional hair color delivered right to your door for less than $25. Many Madison Reed clients comment on how their new hair color has improved their lives, and I count myself among these clients. Madison Reed gives me gray covering, game-changing, blonde locks that I can maintain at home, looking like I just came from the salon. I thought I was chained to monthly salon visits for life, and I never thought I'd color my hair at home again until Madison Reed liberated me. My hair is shiny and healthy, and I get this quality, nuanced color with the convenience of home delivery. That's why I'm very happy to recommend Madison Reed to our listeners. You can join me in finding your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. True Crime Brewery listeners get 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit with the code BREWERY. That's code BREWERY. That's at madison-reed.com. Today's episode is also sponsored by ADT, Real Protection. When it comes to something as important as your family's safety, you deserve real protection from ADT. For me, Real Protection means the nation's number one smart home security provider is standing by and there for you when you need them. Real Protection means having a safe and smart home with everything from video doorbells, surveillance cameras, smart locks, lights, carbon monoxide and smoke detectors in a system that's custom designed to fit your lifestyle. And setting up these custom automations to do things like lock the doors and set the thermostat when you leave. It's all set up for you. Real protection means staying safe on the go, in the car, or when your kids are at school, with the ADT Go app and an SOS button. Real protection means 18,000 employees safeguarding you. Real protection means direct connections with first responders. No matter how you define safety for you, your family, or your business, ADT is there. ADT. Real protection. Just visit ADT.com forward slash podcast to learn more about how ADT can design and install a secure smart home just for you. So back to the story. At the inquest, a picture of Kelly and Duncan at the wedding together, just a few hours after Tegan disappeared, was on the TV news and in the newspapers. Yes, because it's it's lifted. The non-publication is lifted. It's... It's all out there. Like a feeding frenzy. Absolutely. Duncan, Duncan's wife, his brothers, and his mother were in the courtroom. And the plan for that day was for the jury to hear the testimony from Kelly's friends and Duncan. So Lisa Andriata was the friend Kelly spent Christmas 2002 with in the UK after she had lied to police that they had lost touch. After admitting she knew Kelly, had lied to police before visiting her, Lisa claimed that Kelly didn't talk to her about the police investigation while she was overseas. Well, Lisa had met Kelly in college in 1996, but she hadn't spent enough time with Kelly to form her own opinion of Duncan. She did testify that she didn't like Duncan, but she felt that Kelly loved him. And Lisa testified that she'd only heard Kelly mention that she was seeing a man. And Lisa testified that she had heard Kelly mention that she was seeing a man named Andrew Norris. But this was something that she had denied earlier in an interview with police. And this is the woman who had a brother named Andrew Norris. Plus, there was a boy in the high school named Andrew Norris. I don't know if it was the same one, but I think that tells us where she got the idea for this name. Well, there was there was a guy, I think we talk about it later on, some guy she had a one-night stand with. In high school? Possibly had a one-night stand with in high school. And his name was Andrew Norris or Morris. Yeah, so, so it's very, it's so very there, hinky. There's some places where she'd picked up on, on the name. Totally. So Duncan's brother Simon took the stand. The house he lived in with his wife back in 1996 was diagonally across the street from Duncan's house. So they saw a lot of each other during that year. 
Simon testified that the relationship his brother Duncan had with Kelly reminded him of the kind of relationship he had with his own wife before they were married. So he said he expected that they would be married. Simon said that Kelly was a lady who could put weight off and on in varying degrees, but he never suspected she was pregnant, and Duncan never said anything about her being pregnant either. Simon and Duncan's mom, Julie Melville, was the next to testify. She had trained as a midwife, and in 1996, she spent two and a half years working as a nurse in a maternity ward while she was still in training. Now, she said she didn't suspect Kelly was pregnant, and she denied being Kelly's midwife at Tegan's birth, because hers was the name that Kelly had written down, along with a fake mobile number. But Julie didn't even have a cell phone back then. Julie did remember, though, the time in 1999 when she saw Kelly at the Manly Surf Life Saving Club, and Julie felt awkward because Duncan's new girlfriend, who was now his wife, was there. Still, she had said hello to Kelly, and Kelly had told her about her full-time job coaching at Ravenswood, which she seemed excited about. But Julie said that Kelly looked terrible, and she was wearing a short skirt and looked like she had gained a lot of weight. So it seemed like she could have been pregnant at that point. Well, it turns out she was. Yes, exactly. (laughs) So, and then when Duncan took the stand, we learned a DNA test showed that Duncan was not the father of Kelly's first child, even though he was her boyfriend at the time. So obviously she had had sex with someone else while she was with Duncan. But Duncan testified he had no idea Kelly was having an affair or had been unfaithful to him. Yeah, and he went on to claim he didn't see much of Kelly when she was pregnant with Tegan due to their sports training schedules, saying that in 1996 he would have been lucky to see her on weekends. Kelly's water polo commitments meant that Duncan's place would have been a much more convenient place for her to sleep, though, than her parents' place in Manly. But Duncan said that Kelly didn't sleep over that often. He said that he had seen Kelly naked during that time, but he had no idea she was pregnant. Now, he did say that he did have sex with Kelly. He said, though, that they did it in the spooning position, which he described as meaning that they were lying down and he was having sex with her from behind, cuddling into her back. He also had mentioned, I think, that if he put his hand on her abdomen, she would move it away claiming because she'd gained weight, she was embarrassed or something. Well, we can't have him feeling a baby moving around in there. Yes, but she gave him the reason just because she felt fat. Right. Yeah. So when he was asked about attending the wedding with Kelly on the day that Tegan disappeared, Duncan said he didn't remember anything unusual about Kelly's behavior. At one point, Duncan added, Looking back, I can see how she managed to achieve it. I can see how when she was coming towards full term, she probably wouldn't come into the house. She might beep the horn outside my place, and I'd see her out the window, run out and give her a kiss. She'd say, I gotta go to training, I gotta go here, I gotta go there. So he's kind of describing them as two ships passing here and there. Yeah. Still, I find it really incredible to be that out of touch with your partner. Well, and and he was with her for two of them, two of the pregnancies, right? Yes. Weird. Duncan was told that Kelly had claimed he was the father in all three of her live births, and that seemed to surprise him. During the course of the inquest and the investigation into Tegan, it had become apparent that Kelly told a number of lies during the birth and adoption process of baby number one, two, and three. Duncan's mom had been noted on Tegan's medical records as being the home birth midwife that Kelly had during her pregnancy. So that was a lie. And there were also other lies in relation to the adoption of the third secret baby, where Kelly was indicating to adoption workers that Duncan was unwilling to sign consent forms and that he didn't want any involvement with the baby. So Duncan's appearance didn't really make him seem like a nice guy. Despite all of his claims of being really in love with Kelly, he did have this reputation as a player and he had cheated on her at least that once. He also cheated on her another time, and that's when he met his wife Karen in 1998. Now he tried to infer that Kelly's best friend, the one he says he cheated with in 1995, was the one to blame for his infidelity with her. So you can just imagine how that went over. (laughs) No kidding. Well, Duncan probably wasn't the best boyfriend for most (laughs) of the time he and Kelly were together. Sure. There's a big difference between being a selfish guy and someone who's involved in the disappearance of a two-day-old baby. True, very true. 
and despite Kelly's supporters' clear dislike of Duncan, those on the outside looking in, which included the police who were handling the case, were all convinced that Duncan had nothing to do with Tegan's disappearance. No, he was clearly surprised by all this stuff. He didn't really know. Maybe he should have known, but I don't think he did. So Coroner Abernathy, the judge overseeing this hearing, asked journalists to spread a message. He said, Tegan is still missing and there are no new clues. I simply asked the public to turn their minds to it. It must be odd if one considers a two-day-old child is handed over, presumably in a hospital car park or somewhere in the grounds of a hospital, to a couple who are hitherto childless. If you knew them, if you are family and friends close to the persons to whom this child is alleged to have been handed over to, you'd notice that all of a sudden they have a child. It's the sort of thing that I would have thought would stand out. We'd like to see them, and if they come forward... I think the solicitor for Kelly Lane has made it very clear that the Lane family would support them. So he put that out there, but I don't think he was expecting anything to come of it. I think he already has his opinion no, on I, this. No, I think you're right. Yeah. Kelly's father was beside her for the entire hearing, but Mom Sandy only came when it was her turn to testify. And she seemed pretty pissed off about it, her testimony. She demanded that she be allowed to have a cigarette in the enclosed staff area at the back of the building. She argued with staff who told her repeatedly that the area was out of bounds for anyone but staff and that she would have to smoke at the front of the building. Well, she didn't want to do that. All the news people are out there. So I don't know what was in Sandy's heart, but she sure had a hard shell. Boy, didn't she? Yes. Sandy confirmed on the stand that Kelly lived at home until 2000 when she moved out with Peter. Sandy also verified that when Kelly was in a relationship with Duncan, she wasn't at home every night of the week, as she regularly stayed over at Duncan's place. She claimed to know that Kelly was sexually active, and she often gave Kelly money for the pill for which Kelly was prescribed. Yeah, but Sandy admitted that she had never asked Kelly about why she had put the two babies up for adoption and not Tegan, after she found everything out. If Kelly wanted the baby to go to her natural father... They could have had a legal adoption to do that. And oddly to me, Sandy didn't show any curiosity about these grandchildren, the missing one or the two that were adopted. Now, wouldn't you think that there would be some concern about how Tegan was doing if Kelly had, in fact, given her to her biological father? You don't have to be in constant touch, but wouldn't you want to just know she was okay once in a while, hear something, know where she is? Oh, duh. <laughs> yeah. There were more witnesses who were close to Kelly during the years of her secret births, and they took the stand. Stacy, the water polo player from Queensland who shared Kelly's room when she was pregnant with her first secret baby, admitted that she looked at Kelly underwater with her goggles on in 1996 and thought she did look pregnant. Also, the football player from the Manly Rugby Club, who Kelly dated just before she started seeing Duncan, this was the guy between Aaron and Duncan, and I don't know what his name was. And the Ravenswood physical education teacher, Kelly talked to about her breakup with Duncan. And none of them were able to tell the court anything that mattered, just that they'd been lied to also. That was it. So Abernethy wanted to also hear from Taryn and her father, who was Kelly's old coach. His name was David. Taryn and her father didn't want to be involved in the hearing. I'm sure nobody wanted to be. Taryn was playing water polo in Italy, and she and her father had refused to give any statements to police. So the hearing was postponed for eight months until Taryn returned from Europe. The coroner wanted to make sure those eight months weren't wasted waiting for Taryn, so he ordered the New South Wales Births, Deaths, and Marriages Registry to do a cross-check between all birth certificates and midwife certificates for female babies born between September 96 and September 97, and for all schools across the country to keep checking their records for children born on or around the day Tegan was born. So this is fascinating how they did this. It's absolutely amazing. I think the good thing there were computers. You know? yeah. Oh my God, <laughs> can you imagine? The, the manpower that this took. Well, yeah, there were 86,430 female babies born in New South Wales between September 1996 and September 1997. A new computer system had been installed, and more staff members were employed to cross-reference all of these registered births with the hospital and midwife records held by the Department of Health. 
the computer system found 12,083 seemingly unregistered births, and these had to be manually cross-checked by staff. Still quite a bit. Oh, sure is. 12,000? So once simple errors like spelling mistakes and typos of dates were accounted for, there were only 729 births left. To make sure none of them were Tegan, staff had to make hundreds of calls to hospitals and midwives to track down all the birth records, and this took months. At the end of the search, there were just eight female infants other than Tegan who had not been registered by their parents. The details of these eight girls were passed on to police. They were able to track down each of these eight children, and none of them was Tegan. Hospitals and midwives who attend home births are the only source of these application forms, which are stamped to show which hospital or which midwife issued it. So there is a legal requirement for parents to register their children with the births, deaths, and marriages within a month of the birth. But for the most part, this system is relying on parents to do the right thing. A failure to register means, though, that parents might have problems when they try to enroll their children in school or get a passport, anything like that. So almost all children are registered at some point. When parents need a birth certificate for their child, they have to go back to the hospital where their son or daughter was born to get the application form. It's the only place you can get it. The trouble is, once someone has a birth registration form, it would be possible for parents to give false names and dates of the birth. But while it's possible to hide a child's true identity this way, not a single fraudulent birth certificate was found during this extensive cross-check. Not one of the 86,430 girls that they checked could be Tegan, registered under a false name or date of birth. It just couldn't be. Now, Kelly was going to be the last witness to take the stand. But before, it was Taryn and her father. Taryn had been overseas for most of 1996, but she had heard about Kelly being pregnant, and she had looked at Kelly through her goggles underwater to see for herself. Now, she didn't say anything to Kelly at the time, nor did Kelly say anything to her. No, nobody said anything to Kelly that we know of. They just kind of talked behind her back about it. Taryn's father and Kelly's old coach, David, had nothing significant to add, and he confirmed that he didn't talk to Kelly about the change in her physical appearance. Now, I don't know if they're just trying to be polite because they thought she was just gaining weight and they didn't want to point out that she looked fat. Right. I mean, to me, it just seems like it had to be significant. It wasn't just a little pudginess in a bathing suit. Yeah. I'm under the impression that when the other girls were looking at her and saying she looks pregnant, they were right. I mean, I know know they were right. But I don't think they're going to be talking that way just because she's put on a couple pounds. No, because she could hold some weight. She was tall, well-built. So I don't know. Kelly had the right to remain silent, and she took that right. This was not a court. This was just a hearing. So she was under the basis that anything she could say might incriminate her. So her lawyer said, don't say a word. Well, sure. I mean, that's the way it works in the U.S., too. You don't have to to say anything. But the next day, February 15th, 2006 the coroner handed down his written finding, and it read, There are factors going to the proposition that Tegan Lane is alive. Abernathy listed them. The child's body has never been found. There is no forensic evidence of death, such as suspicious blood splatters or anything. And Kelly put her first and third secret children up for adoption. He also lists the possibility that Kelly did hand over Tegan to her biological father in the hospital car park and that the people caring for Tegan are for some reason refusing to come forward, although he thinks the likelihood of either of these things was very remote. Then he listed the facts that he found were convincing about why Tegan is dead, and this finding stated that this included the fact that Tegan has not been seen since she was in Auburn District Hospital after her birth, the multiplicity of versions and untruths given to a range of persons by Kelly, the initial denial by Kelly of giving birth to the child at all, the fact that there's been a very careful search, at least in this state of birth records, and no sign of the birth being registered, the publicity surrounding Andrew Norris and Mel, and the efforts police made to locate this Norris guy, the school inquiries, and the intense media coverage from the time Kelly Lane was teaching at Ravenswood. Of course, there was also Kelly's inappropriate behavior, that day that Tegan disappeared. 
Abernathy wrote that he found it unlikely that a man with whom she was having an affair, who already had a partner, and who was initially very angry on learning that Kelly was pregnant, nevertheless was happy to take this baby. And it's all the more unlikely because his partner also agreed to it. And finally, Kelly Lane added Tegan Lane's name to her own Medicare card while at the hospital, but no arrangement was ever made to alter that so that Norris could take care of claiming benefits for the child later on. All damning stuff. Again, his finding also accused Kelly of wasting the police's time by taking them to a block of units where she claimed Andrew Norris lived when they were having their affair, saying that detailed police inquiries confirmed that there had never been an Andrew Norris at those apartments. So he then outlined that there wasn't enough evidence to charge anyone with Tegan's murder or any other offense relating to the baby's disappearance. So while her family and friends might believe Tegan is still alive, Abernathy didn't. He was satisfied that Tegan Lane was deceased. But he was forced to hand down an open finding, meaning that the case was not yet closed. The case was given over to the homicide squad immediately after the coroner's finding was handed down. The Lanes and Kelly's other supporters returned to their lives in Manly, knowing that the police believed that Tegan was dead. So they know this isn't over. They do. In late 2006, a task force was formed, and this was headed by two detectives, and they continued to look for any evidence of Tegan and her father. These were exhausting tasks, and they were made worse by their failure to turn up anything. Kelly's marriage suffered and she and Peter separated not long after the conclusion of the inquest. Genetic testing revealed the father of Kelly's first adopted baby was a rugby player that Kelly had been seeing before she started going out with Duncan. The other adopted baby was fathered by a friend of Kelly's brother. By the end of 2009, the police made their move. The exhaustive search that revealed nothing was part of the proof that Tegan was dead. Kelly's behavior the day Tegan disappeared her behavior during her police interviews, and her unconvincing stories made her very suspect. And Kelly was then, finally, charged with Tegan's murder. So on December 4th, 2009, Kelly appeared in court to plead to the charges. And there were three charges at that point. She pled not guilty to the charge of murdering her daughter and not guilty to two charges of perjury. She was released on $30,000 bail. For the trial, Justice Anthony Wheely would preside. Mark Tedeschi would be the prosecutor. And Kelly would be represented by Keith Chappell. And this was a legal aid lawyer because the parents have used up all their money. Before the trial began, testimony was heard from two people. One was Kelly's friend Natalie, who claimed to have met Andrew Norris at one time. However, on cross-examination, she admitted she couldn't really remember meeting such a man, which supported the Crown's argument that he didn't exist. Then the other pretrial testimony came from a man who may have had a one-night stand with Kelly 16 years previously. The interesting thing about this is his name was Andrew Morris. But this would have been before she had her babies. Yes, any of well them. before she'd had any of the babies. But he could have been the father of one of the aborted fetuses. Possibly, he could have. So her trial began on August 9th, 2010. The evidence was similar to what had been presented at the inquest four years earlier. The major difference was the continued efforts to find Tegan and this Andrew guy. Kelly's defense rested on the lack of evidence about how or where Tegan had been killed. And this trial was long. It lasted four months. After deliberating for a week, the jury found Kelly guilty of lying under oath, but they were unable to come to a unanimous verdict on the murder charge. And the judge gave them the option of returning a verdict of 11 to 1. And a little later that day, the jury did that. So in March of 2011, sentencing commenced. A psychiatrist appeared on behalf of the Crown and he stated that he had found no evidence for a psychiatric disorder in Kelly. She was sentenced to 18 years with a non-parole period of 13 years, 5 months. She's actually up for parole in 2023. So was it just this past April that she appealed? Or no. was that in 2011? Well, there, there's a couple of appeals. After the sentencing, there was an appeal. That was rejected in 2013. 
And then her attorney made a further appeal to the High Court, which I guess is like the Supreme Court of Australia, or at least a higher court than the one they were in. And this appeal was rejected in 2014. So and one of the, the reasons for doing the first appeal was that a taxi driver came forward who claims he saw Kelly dump the baby in Bushland on the way to Manly. The driver said he picked up Kelly from Auburn Hospital, stopped where she asked him to, and he thought he saw her leave the baby and return to the taxi empty-handed. Then he claims after dropping Kelly off, he returned to the scene where he found a woman there who said she would take care of the baby. Now, why would that go for her appeal? Because he's saying that the baby's alive somewhere? He's saying Even that, though it wasn't her doing to keep the baby alive? Right. Wow. But, but they looked at taxi records. There was absolutely no record of Kelly being picked up by a cab at so the this hospital. this guy was making it up, probably. Yeah. Okay. And then, come on, he tells him he, she dropped the baby off, got back in the cab, he took her to Manly, and then turned around went back to check on the baby? Oh, mm-hmm. come on. That just strains believability. It sure does. Yeah, that's incredible. But there was recently a special in 2018. It's called Expose the Case of Kelly Lane, where they bring up some new things, where they try and say that the police missed talking to certain people. They speak to Kelly Lane herself, who I guess subsequently after this trial, she's given up the whole Morris Norris thing and just said it was a guy named Andrew. She doesn't know the last name. So she's changed that story again. Well, she had to. I mean, there just was not any evidence that there was an Andrew Morris or Andrew Norris. So it's easier just to say, oh, it's a guy named Andrew. I guess, but I think that makes you less believable. Almost better to stick to your story, even if it's not believable. Yeah, well, it's we've learned that, right? Once you start lying, you got to stick to the same lie. Kind of, yeah. So she's missed out on raising her baby that she did keep. Right. Her, Her sixth pregnancy, yeah. Well, I just think, uh, I don't know what to think about the parents, the friends, everybody. It just seems like a very dysfunctional world she was living in, which I understand that sometimes young people are in denial about their pregnancies. Well, sure. But I mean, she was experienced with it by the time she had Tegan. She'd already put one up for adoption. She could have done that again. Yeah, well, I'm just flabbergasted by the first and the third births were adopted. And the middle one wasn't. I just don't know why that one wasn't. I I really, it sounds awful, but I think it was a convenience thing for her. For some reason in her life, which she's balancing these two different lives, really, that was going to get in the way because it is a process. And, you know, for all the lying she did, she wasn't very good at it. (laughs) No, she wasn't. No, not at all. But if you want to check out that recent special, Exposed, that's really interesting. There's also a book about this case called The Nice Girl. I'll have to look up the author, and I'll I'll put uh, links to these things in the show notes for everybody in case you want to find out more about this, because it is a fascinating case. And we still, I guess we'll never really know what happened to Tegan. I don't think she's ever going to admit what she did. I would be pretty sure that the baby's dead. Well, we can be sure of that in our own minds, but I don't think we're ever going to get confirmation of that from her. No. And she's the only one who can really confirm it. I would be amazed. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. That was a good talk that we had. It was. As I told you, it's a disturbing case. Well, it is, especially, you know, as someone who's worked in maternity and pediatrics, we know how these things work, and it's really quite amazing that she did this. I mean, we're very familiar with women who do go from hospital to hospital for other reasons, usually drugs or something like that, but... She was clearly trying to do the same sort of thing to hide previous pregnancies. Yes, she was. And the interesting thing is when they talked to her obstetrician for her final pregnancy where she kept the baby and she was in that relationship, she was really very good about keeping her appointments, getting her prenatal care. It was a total turnaround. Yeah. Well, some of that was because she was in a relationship and she wasn't doing water polo anymore except as a coach. Yeah, that's kind of a horrible thing that she did right there, playing that game while she was far along in her pregnancy. Uh, I don't think she recognized the danger of doing that. Did she, or did she just not care? She drank. You know, she didn't just have a glass of wine. She went out partying. Yeah, that's true, too. I don't think she really cared that much. And people knew about fetal alcohol syndrome in the 90s. Absolutely. Mm Mm-hmm. 
don't give her too much credit because I don't think she deserves it. Okay. And I know I'm kind of biased on this, but I think a lot of our listeners are going to agree with me on this one. They all agree with you. No. <laughs> I don't think we all ever agree on anything. But, I mean, if you're a mother, if you're a parent, you have to be really disturbed and disgusted by her behavior. There's no way around it. No. No. Today's show has been sponsored by ADT, Real Protection. When it comes to something as important as your family's safety, you deserve real protection from ADT. Real Protection means the nation's number one smart home security provider is there for you when you need them. Real Protection means 18,000 employees safeguarding you. No matter how you define safety, ADT is there. ADT, Real Protection. Visit ADT.com slash podcast to learn more about how ADT can design and install a secure smart home just for you. The music for True Crime Brewery was written and produced by Tristan Capel. Tristan is our nephew who's very talented, and Tristan recently moved to New York City to make a name for himself as a jazz musician. So good luck, Tristan. And this is the time in our show when we tell listeners about our members-only episodes that are produced exclusively for our Team Tie Grabber members and our Patreon supporters. In February, our members-only episode was about female serial killer Sheila Labar, who seduced, abused, and killed young men on her New Hampshire farm. In March, we're doing a members-only episode on a guy named Robert Reldon. And Robert Reldon was a serial rapist and murderer, a handsome, personable, charmer kind of guy like Ted Bundy, who had a friendly smile and seemed to inspire trust in people. So for 20 years, he caused a dozen or more unsuspecting women to drop their guard and put themselves in danger with him. We also have a big backlog of episodes in our members-only feed, and this includes episodes on Diane Downs, O.J. Simpson, Tina Watson, Robert Fisher, and Clara Harris. So if you'd like to give support to the podcast and get some extra episodes, you can just go to our website, tiegrabber.com, and you can join. And our members also get a snifter or a bottle opener as a gift from us. One other thing, we always appreciate reviews on iTunes or wherever you listen to the show. Now it's time for feedback. You can have your feedback read on TCB by sending us an email to truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com. Or you can tell us what's on your mind by leaving a voicemail on our Leave a Voicemail tab on the right side of the screen on the website homepage. Either way you do it, we'd love to hear from you. So I got one voicemail and two or three emails for you, Jill. And the voicemail's from Cynthia. She has a case suggestion. No, I have two from Cynthia. Yes, you do. And the reason you have two is because (laughs) she gave the wrong first name of the victim. In the first voicemail. So, so are we playing both, or are we just going to play the first one and correct Just play the first one, and then you can correct. Okay. So here is Cynthia. Hello, this is Cindy. I'm from South Central Pennsylvania. I would like you to look into the story of Karen Reinert. She was a teacher whose body was found in the trunk of a car at the Harrisburg Marriott. Her two children have never been found. We have lots of breweries around here, but I think you would like Trogue's Nugget Nectar. It's an Imperial imperial Amber Ale. And that's it for me. Thanks. All right. Cindy's right to the point. I like that. She is. She's very concise. And then the, <laughs> the second voicemail is to say it's not Karen Reinhardt. It's Susan Reinhardt. Okay. That's the only difference. All right. So give us a little background on this case because it sounds dreadful. It does. And I think we've been asked about this before because it kind of sounds familiar, and I think we want to do it. This is about a quiet English teacher, the mother of two young children, a beloved and trusted fiancé who is a fellow English teacher, and a devoted follower of poet Ezra Pound, and a suburban high school principal who had served as an Air Force colonel. But two of these three had a double life that eventually led to murder. Turns out that the trusted fiancé was living with another woman while dating at least two others one of whom was a former student. And he was doing all this while bad-mouthing the woman who believed she was his fiance. The principal turned out to have a strong fascination with Satan and bestiality, and was arrested for armed robbery after being found with guns, drugs, pornography, and nitric acid. Nitric acid? What's wrong with that? Well... What were they doing with nitric acid? We were going to find out. Okay. All right, so this sounds pretty twisted. Doesn't it? Yep. 
besides all this stuff going on and, and the teacher who was killed and found in the trunk, her kids have just disappeared from the face of the earth. Wow. Sounds like a movie, though. Doesn't it? Yes. Sounds like it's something that's unbelievable. Well, it actually was made into a TV miniseries, I believe, and maybe a crime novel. Well, we're going to find out. Okay. I'll check on it. All right. Thanks, Cindy. Okay. So, emails. I got one from Elixir, who has a comment on one of our recent shows, Happily Never After. Happily Never After. That was a couple weeks ago in February, about a woman who was murdered by a guy who married her and just treated her like shit the whole time. He was just a user, wanted her money. Anyway, Elixir says, I found this case to be extremely upsetting. The way the victim without a voice is bashed by the man who killed her is extremely sad. The fact she wanted to love someone and have a family, and she met this guy who wanted her just for her money, is completely grotesque. I don't get how the victim ends up being put on trial. With the Chris Watts case, we can see this sort of excusing the reasons why men do what they do, or did what they did. The sentence for Julie's murder doesn't fit the crime and is really disturbing. And of course, I agree with you totally, and that's one of the reasons we picked this case, just so we could get her name out there as someone who was a good person and really got a shitty deal out of life. She did, and and then she was victimized more after death. Yeah, in the hearing, yes. And we see it a little bit with the Chris Watts case, which we also covered that one recently. And we see that with people knocking Shanann Watts, you know, because she worked for this pyramid company, because maybe she was too controlling. I mean, none of us are perfect, but we don't deserve to be murdered by someone who's supposed to love us and take care of us. That's just bullshit. Yes. So I am totally with you on being saddened and grossed out by that whole thing. Very upsetting case. Well, thank you, Elixir. Yes. Then Secret Spy wrote in with a comment on Madeline McCann. He or she said, check out Madeline McCann case solved and learn something. So I went to there and what I learned was that the National Enquirer has solved the case. They said that Madeline had been kidnapped by sex traffickers and was in Bolivia. Okay, but you're, you're not really saying that. You're being sarcastic. I've, well, it's just a pile of bull. You don't really believe it's been solved. I wouldn't believe anything that's written in the National Enquirer. Okay, well... Well, maybe I shouldn't say it that much, but that is not a newspaper I go to learn anything factual. Okay, but still it's interesting to read and see why they're saying that. Was there any actual evidence of this? Or? No. All right, so yes. that's still an unsolved case, Maddie McCann. But a lot of people have opinions on that case. Strong opinions. They do. And well, and, and sex traffickers was one of the ideas. It's a total possibility. So, but I mean, I'm kind of on the side of the parents did something. Yeah. And again, I'm not going to believe anything I read in the National Enquirer. No, because I think it's just speculation unless it's backed up. You got it. Okay. One final email from Denise, and she has a case suggestion. Denise writes, Hello, Jill and Dick. Thank you for your podcast. You're great, and I'm always looking forward to a new episode. Today marks 10 years since the disappearance of Amber Dubois in Escanito, California. It would be a year and another young victim, and a third attempted, before her attacker, a registered sex offender, John Gardner, would lead the police to her body. After the body of Chelsea King was found in a shallow grave at Lake Hodges, DNA evidence led detectives to Gardner. Police then suspected Gardner in the disappearance of Amber, and it was the selflessness of Chelsea's parents who agreed to take the death penalty off the table if it would lead detectives to Amber's body. The murder of these two girls was devastating to our community, as both girls were just in high school, and they were no match for the size of Gardner. Amber was simply walking to school that morning, Chelsea was out for a run around the lake. Between the two murders was another attempt, a woman also out for a run around Lake Hodges, who was attacked but punched him in the face and managed to escape. I remember the news reports about this assault, and the police reported it as an attempted robbery, which I immediately thought was suspicious. Who has anything of value on them when they're running? Nothing but a phone or an iPod. It just didn't seem right. I recall, too, that Gardner had been found in violation of his parole several times and was just released, free to wreak havoc on our community. 
After writing about this, it feels wrong to talk about beer, but I'm sure Dick will recognize Escanido as the home of Stone Brewery. And if you feel like you may have mentioned Stone too many times, fear not, for North County San Diego is home to many, many microbreweries. Thanks again for your amazing work, Denise. So that's a case that I think we ought to look at also. Okay. This was fairly recent? Ten years ago. That's fairly recent. It is. But it sounds interesting, and I I would love to dig more into it about, particularly with the third victim, Chelsea. Her parents took the death penalty off the table in return for the guy showing them where the first child was buried. That's, That's an amazing thing. Yeah. Yep, it is. I mean, I think maybe they spoke to Amber's parents and decided this is what they wanted. I mean, I think you have to come together with other victims' families. I I would think they did, but I think that's just a a very altruistic thing to do. (laughs) Yeah. And Denise, yes, I love Stone Brewery. And I I love a lot of San Diego breweries. Modern Times is great. North County, I think, is around there. Great places. Can't go wrong with any San Diego beers. Oh, well, thank you for a great letter, Denise. Yes. And thank you to everyone who sends in their opinions, either by voicemail or email or comments on social media. We appreciate it very much. We do. And I'll see you at the quiet end. Okay, we'll be back soon with another case at the quiet end. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.